Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming in this afternoon session. I am Jacqueline Alessi, the co-chair for this uh, session. And with me, I have six wonderful uh, presenters who will be presenting their, uh, their, post their oral uh, posters. Uh, and each one of them will be given some few minutes to present their work. And without wasting a lot of time, uh, allow me to welcome uh, Nora Rosbach Ros from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, United States uh, of America. So she will be presenting about integrated youth through friendly services led. Yeah. So she can come and present her session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm going to be presenting some of the results from a study called Girl Power, um, which was a collaboration between UNC Project in Malawi and Desmond Tutu Foundation um, in South Africa, um, as well as the Lilongwe District Health Office. And I'll be presenting some of the Malawi results today. Um, to start with some background, we know that in sub-Saharan Africa, adolescent girls and young women face dire sexual and reproductive health and HIV outcomes. Um, we know that um, in Malawi, 10% of young women are infected by the time they're 25 years old, um, and more than half of young women have a first birth in adolescence, so by the time that they are 19. Um, and we also know that this population has the worst care-seeking outcomes. Um, and they face a range of different barriers to access, from the provider level to issues of privacy um, to issues of access. There is some evidence that models of youth-friendly health services could have an impact, but there hadn't been a well-designed study that followed a longitudinal cohort to see whether changing um, the service delivery model to an integrated youth-friendly services one had greater health impacts compared to a standard of care. Um, and so that was one of the main questions we set out to answer in Girl Power, was whether a platform of integrated sexual and reproductive health services for young women increased their use of a range of services. So in Girl Power, what we did is we chose four clinics in Malawi, and each of these clinics offered a different model of care. Um, in each of these clinics, we enrolled a cohort of 250 young women, and we followed them for one year. So in all of our clinics, there was the standard of care, which was vertical services. Um, so you could get STI syndromic management, you could get HIV testing, you could get hormonal contraception, but all of these were in separate places. You had to wait in separate queues, and you had to wait with members of the general population. In clinics two, three, and four, we in implemented a model of youth-friendly health services. And what this looked like is we created certain spaces within the facilities um, that would be staffed with providers who were trained in non-judgmental and youth-friendly approaches. We hired peer educators who did recruitment in the community. Um, and then once young women came to the clinic, they offered um, patient education, health promotion, and clinic navigation. Um, and importantly, the spaces where these services were offered um, were, were um, in a separate area from where older adults waited. Um, we also had several other services that were offered in clinics three and four, um, but that's not the main focus of this analysis. So the results that I will show will be comparing clinic one in light blue to clinics two, three, and four, which had youth-friendly health services in dark blue. So this is what we found. When we looked at HIV testing, condoms, and hormonal contraception, and when we looked at the proportion of women who got these services at least once, as well as the mean number of times these services were received over one year, we found that the model of youth-friendly health services performed better. Um, and this was true in clinics two, three, and four compared to clinic one. In terms of what some of our next steps are, um, we have learned that if you change the model of care, that you could get young women to come, um, and that some next steps are to think about, are there additional services that could be offered on this kind of platform, like PrEP? 
um, and also how to take this model, which we implemented on a small scale, um, and bring it to a larger scale. Um, and what we know is that adolescents are not just younger adults. They are a distinct population group with special um, needs. And when you remove the barriers, um, that they are able to get services. Actually, she did it in five minutes. That's really great. Thank you so much, Natal uh, no, Nora. So our next presenter is uh, Natalia, who is presenting about meaningful engagement of schools and school-based advocates in promoting education on HIV and supporting adolescents living with HIV in Kenya. I'd like to thank the organizers for giving us an opportunity to present you some of the results of our implementation project that is funded by the Positive Action by VIV uh, through the ECPAF and is conducted in the area of uh, Homa Bay, Kenya, one of the areas of Kenya most heavily affected by HIV epidemic. The uh, red carpet program has been launched in 2016 and it is a larger program that consists of three elements. One of those elements is uh, uh, school engagement. Two other elements involve healthcare facilities and uh, uh, young advocates, or APAG, Adolescent Youth uh, Peer Advisory Group. Uh, the project's primarily goal when launched has been to really straighten and facilitate and improve linkage to care of newly diagnosed adolescents and young adults to the uh, care for HIV and assure that early retention in a fragile period following the news about HIV positive status is really met the goals. And we have published results of health care facility involvement in Jade Supplement last year where we have shown a significant improvement in the linkage to care rates. Today I'm going to talk about the school component of that uh, uh, three-pillar program, and I would like to share you with results that they focus only on 2017. The goal of the Red Carpet Project is to enhance the collaboration, cooperation, partnership between the schools and healthcare facilities that are red carpet healthcare facilities, which we currently have 50 in the area. For adolescents in Kenya and in this region, the schools are their community. Kenya practices boarding school approach through the public sector of education, which means a very large proportion of young people are leaving at secondary school, except for the vacation and some break time when they join the family. So indeed, for them, it is a community of daily living. The program is building the capacity of adolescent health advocates at school that are represented by multiple school personnel, it also works with uh, uh, the school management and leadership, and very close collaboration has been developed with the Ministry of Health. <coughs> 63 schools have developed school-based HIV strategies. We work with 67 schools, and we have engaged with them through sensitization meeting last year in August. And between August and September, we have conducted two large trainings where we trained 90 school-based advocates to work. But 63 schools have developed school-based strategies, which involve formation of school health committee. As a result of the work, 33,505 youth have been reached with messaging and education about HIV, including stigma and other issues. And 264 adolescents and youth living with HIV HIV, and you can see distribution of the gender with slightly dominant more females, have disclosed the HIV status at school and are supported with adherence, counseling, clinical care, relationship with the related healthcare facilities, storage of meds, and intake of daily meds and psychosocial support. And this is briefly our results. We did a baseline assessment of the region's schools. And you can see in the first two comparisons, these are the schools that already had some guidance and counseling teacher. And then you can see that we increased the percentage to 100%. These are 67 schools. You can see we have created active health committee 
a school health committee aimed at adolescent health overall, not to stigmatize it around HIV, 94%. We have trained, and you can see how deficient the training was on caring for learners living for HIV, significant amount of school personnel. And finally, school were linked to a healthcare facility have risen significantly as well. So the direct liaison person exists at each school with relevant healthcare facilities. I don't have acknowledgement slide, but I would like to really express the most deep gratitude to an incredible body of Ministry of Education of Health in the area and uh, all the teachers and counselors, uh, school matrons, school nurses, um, uh, boarding and charge personnel who have been working with us on this project. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Natalia. She's from Elizabeth uh, Glazer. Our next speaker is uh, Lucy. Lucy is from Oxford University, and she'll be presenting about the cash plus care presentation. Thank you very much. Well, um, this has already been a really exciting session, so I'm, I'm delighted to be next up. And I'd just like to um, give credit to Yanina, who's sitting on the second row, who in this study not only did the fancy statistical analyses, um, but also spent many hours packing butternut squashes into the back of pickup trucks to deliver to families. So we're going to be talking about, for, for five minutes now, about parenting and violence prevention for teenagers. And sometimes we think, how does this fit in with our big global responses to HIV prevention. But the, the DREAMS program has been really quite um, forward thinking and thinking for teenagers about how important the combinations of cash and care, particularly violence prevention, might be for, for HIV prevention and risk reduction. And essentially, <coughs> um, this, this project was developed with the WHO and UNICEF with the goal of improving parenting and reducing family violence for teenagers in low- and middle-income countries. There's 30 years of evidence of these programs in high-income countries. All of the evidence-based programs have been developed by academics and sold to companies and are now all commercialized. So in some ways, we've been making generics. <clears throat> but what we did essentially was work over five years with a huge collaborative team to develop a program that could be run by local community members under a tree with no technology, and then tested it um, in a, in a high-quality, pragmatic cluster randomized trial. For anyone not familiar with what a pragmatic trial is, it means you don't do the perfect program. Local NGOs and people run the program, and as the researcher, you, you just do the research and you stand back and hope to hell it's going to go OK. <laughs> What did the program consist of? Essentially, it was a combination of learning about monitoring and praising your teenager, thinking about problem solving as a family and as a group in a group-based program, and then really introduced as, as a part of pressure from, um, from communities was a family budgeting and savings component, an economic strengthening component, which is not in any of the high income um, parts. And I'm happy to talk methods if you have questions, but it was a, a 40 village cluster RCT where pretty much everything went wrong, um, as with any RCT of anyone who will admit it. So what were the results? Well, this study was not powered to pick up HIV incidents, but what it was powered to pick up was a set of absolutely crucial drivers in HIV risk behavior for our adolescents in Africa. We see reduction in abuse in the family. We see increased rates of involved parenting and increased rates of parental monitoring, which is very key in improving, um, improving young people's capacity um, to limit their sexual risk. We see lower rates of drug and alcohol use amongst both caregivers and adolescents and greater family planning to protect teens in the community. We also see reduced rates of shortfalls of food in the family. So th this program did not do everything. You can see that there's a whole section of no intervention effects. But what I think these findings are really telling us is that parenting and violence prevention can be an absolutely essential component of the response that we provide to adolescent HIV. 
but that also it can be an evidence-based component to that response. What's happened within an astonishingly rapid um, period of time, and often much of this has been driven by, um, by USA PEPFAR, by DREAMS, by four children, but also by WHO, by UNICEF, by a range of governments. We've seen a spread of this program. The, the, um, the findings were only published about three or four months ago, so we've seen a very rapid spread of this program. We think it's probably reaching about 400,000 families across around um, 20 countries now. There seems to be new ones every morning. And we'd like to say thank you to our funders. And a real urge, let's start thinking about violence prevention for adolescents as part of this response. Thank you. I must admit, I have the best speakers for the day. So <laughs> they're keeping time to give us all time to discuss. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Robin Miller. Robin Miller is from Michigan. Uh, Michigan State University, and she'll be presenting about uh, improving timely linkage to care uh, among the newly infected. Yeah. Thank you very much. I want to start by acknowledging all of the members of the Adolescent Medicine Trials Network for HIV AIDS interventions who worked so hard and long on the project I'm going to talk about briefly today, and all of the youth that they served uh, uh, and who contributed to the data that I'm going to show you. Oops, it's not going down. There we go. Okay. Uh, in 2009, the uh, Adolescent Trials Network entered into a strategic partnership to develop a linkage to care initiative that was multi-site and multi-level. And I think one of the things that's very novel about this program is its multi-leveled integrated nature. Um, there were 20 sites that participated in the intervention overall, but I'm going to focus on the eight sites today that were in both SMILE 1 and SMILE 2, as this was a two-phase intervention program. In phase one of the intervention, each of the sites hired a dedicated coordinator, and their job was not only to work uh, exclusively on linking newly diagnosed youth to care, but also to work to create um, a communication network among all of the providers locally so that they had uh, quick access to information about newly diagnosed youth anywhere in their jurisdiction. Some cases they had public health authority and were granted real-time access to information. In other cases, they had to really use this network to get that uh, comparable information. Uh, in phase two, uh, the program partnered with local coalitions to initiate structural changes to promote uh, timely linkage to care for youth. So they engage things in initiatives like trying to change the way in which um, transportation vouchers were um, accessed by youth newly diagnosed to care, changing policies and practices so that youth could access entitlements more quickly. So in this particular poster, we're focused on those eight sites we're in both using an interrupted time series design because what we're interested in trying to figure out is whether structural change matters and whether it adds value above and beyond the kind of individual level intervention activity and the uh, interagency activity that the coordinator engaged in. In these eight sites, there were 2,115 youth re referred over the six-year period. 68% uh, of those youth were linked to care, and I'm going to focus on those youth in particular. 80% uh, of those youth were black, 79% were male, and 62% were MSM, which also makes this an unusual initiative in that so many of the young people that were linked to care were in the highest risk groups uh, within the United States, both in terms of their age and their sexual orientation and their race. So I want to just briefly highlight um, that this initiative uh, it was highly significant in reducing the number of days that it took to link youth to care over the six-year period. In addition, all of our analyses suggest that the addition of the structural changes, uh, which began in 2012, um, were also a significant contribution to creating a stable system through which youth were linked to care. 
we had also the goal of linking youth to care in uh, 42 days or fewer. Um, and you can see here that by the end of 2015, the proportion of youth linked to care in 42 days or fewer rose dramatically from where we started. Uh, for these particular eight sites, by the end of the initiative, 100% of youth who were linked to care were linked in 42 days or fewer. Um, and our averages were, you know, approaching close to zero by the end of the uh, initiative, meaning that people were able to link youth to care in uh, so rapidly as they were close to 24-hour linkages. So our conclusion from this work is that these kinds of strategic, integrated, and multi-level interventions have real promise uh, for creating stable systems by which we can link youth to care, and particularly youth who are uh, in the most vulnerable positions within the urban centers where we did our work. Thank you so much, uh, Robin. Our next speaker is uh, Roxana. She's from uh, University of Oxford in UK, and she's presenting about the 1990-48. So curious also to know about it. Uh, thank you. Today I'll be presenting clinical findings from Nzansiwako, which is a longitudinal and mixed method study of 10 to 19 year old adolescents living with HIV in the Eastern Cape of South Africa. Um, Nzansiwako is actually the world's largest cohort of adolescents living with HIV with 1,058 positive teens. Uh, and the work is, uh, that I'm focusing on is quantitative, so I'll be focusing more on that here. It has two major components. One are the interviews that we do with the adolescents at each time point in the study. And the second component are the clinical records that we extract from their patient files. And that's the basis on which I'll be presenting today. And so our participants at baseline were receiving healthcare from 52 different facilities, ranging from clinics to tertiary hospitals throughout the Buffalo City Municipality and the Amatole Health District. And at each of those 52 facilities, we searched for the files of all 1,058 adolescents using paper-based and clinical uh, electronic medical records. And so this very intensive data collection process allowed us to capture the silent transfers that are so often missed in South Africa, unless, of course, they move far outside of our catchment area, such as to Cape Town, which, at this point, we haven't been going to those clinics just yet. Um, but using those clinical records, what we wanted to do was to first characterize a treatment cascade for these adolescents to understand how they were progressing along the cascade and where there were the main gaps in care and care outcomes. So you can see here that around 90% of the total uh, adolescents had patient files at the clinic. So this means that they had entered the clinic at some point and a file was opened. And among those with the patient files, 92% had available viral load data, meaning that they had ever done a viral load test and that was in their file. But when we look within the viral load data that was available, only 76% were less than 1,000 copies at their most recent visit. And further, only 58% were undetectable at that most recent visit. And this corresponds to about 48% of the total cohort of positive adolescents. Now, some of this might not be surprising to those of you who've seen the HSRC results from 2017 from South Africa, which estimates suppression to be between 48 and 52 percent for this age group. Uh, but what's unique about our data set is that its granularity provides more nuance. We found that only 63 percent of the viral loads, the most recent viral load, was were done within the past two years. That means 40 percent of those adolescents, when they go to the clinic, the viral load data that's available there is from three or more years ago which really has a lot of implications for the kind of care that they're going to be receiving. And when we looked at only those viral loads that were done in the past two years, the rate of viral suppression was only 30%, which indicates that there's really a lot of work to be done to get the adolescents to the level of health that we really all want them to be achieving. But we also wanted to analyze sort of the risk profiles to see which adolescents were most at risk of falling off at each of the steps of this cascade. I don't have time to go through all of the different factors, but I'll just highlight a few interesting trends that we found. The first is that we found that being an older adolescent, so 15 or older, was found to be a risk factor for many of these uh, outcomes, going from having a viral load in your patient file all the way to having an undetectable viral load at your most recent visit. 
By contrast, those who are on ART for longer, so at least two years, were more likely to have positive outcomes, to have lower viral loads. One that was quite interesting was receiving decentralized care. Whereas receiving decentralized care uh, was associated with having a more recent viral load, decentralized adolescents were less likely to have undetectable viral loads at their most recent visit. So this is something that's quite interesting and potentially we can discuss later. Using a marginal effects model, we also found that three of these main effects were further qualified by significant interactions with gender and mode of infection. So I'll try to walk through those quickly. So for the outcome of having a viral load, your most recent viral load measured in the past two years, there was a significant interaction between decentralization and gender. So as I showed in the previous slide, even though decentralized care was predictive of um, having a more recent viral load for both boys and girls, we found that the effect was greater for girls than it was for boys. And this could potentially be that girls coming to the clinic are also coming for SDI treatment or testing or pregnancy. And so while they're there, they may also just get a pregnancy, uh, may also just get a viral load test. Um, but it could also be related to stigma that boys are experiencing. Uh, it needs to be analyzed a bit further. And the other two uh, effects that we found with interactions uh, were both for having a viral load less than or equal to 1,000 copies. So I'll start on the left with age. As you can see here, and also matches the previous slide, uh, regardless of mode of infection and gender, adolescents who are older were less likely to have a low viral load. And a particularly at-risk group that we found were those who were vertically infected, um, the boys who were vertically infected. So these are uh, probably disengaging from care as they get older and practicing more masculine norms of behavior. Um, and the second one is now uh, looking at time on art. Uh, you can see here that being on art for longer, uh, was you were more likely to have a low viral load, except for one group, and those were the boys who were horizontally infected. Um, and so the longer they were in art, the more likely they were to have higher viral load, uh, which is probably because it also related to age and uh, treatment fatigue. The one particularly at-risk group that we did find here, though, were the vertically infected boys who were recently initiating art. These are likely the, long t um, the late progressors, so they may be engaging in care at a later stage of infection. Um, and they may have also experienced uh, confusion or um, a lot of internalized stigma about just learning their HIV diagnosis at a later age. So very much in conclusion, the rates are lower than uh, we like. There's still a lot of work to be done. Um, and let's also not forget the boys, especially the late progressing boys uh, and the adolescents as they get older. Um, and I'm happy to take more questions. Thanks. Thank you so much, um, Roxana. Now, welcome Rachel, who will be presenting about a randomized uh, controlled trial of a patient. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Rachel Vreeman. I'm honored to be presenting this work that was done in the AMPATH collaboration. AMPATH is an academic partnership that's led by Indiana University, the Moy University School of Medicine, and Moy Teaching and Referral Hospital in Kenya. And I want to particularly acknowledge uh, Dr. Nyandiko and other members of our AMPATH team who are here today. It's my honor to present on behalf of everyone. This work was funded by an R01 from the National Institutes of Mental Health in the United States. So presenting a randomized controlled trial of a patient-centered disclosure counseling intervention for Kenyan children living with HIV. Now, discussing the issue of disclosure, from the moment that a child is diagnosed with HIV, their parent or other caregiver is thinking about this critical time when they will inform their child of this diagnosis. They're wondering when they will do this, how they will do this, what the child's questions will be, what the impact will be, and so on. So this study was set out to try to see whether a patient-centered disclosure counseling intervention could be effective in supporting families through that process. We called it Hadithi, which means story in Kiswahili. And we used that term not only because uh, this was a narrative-based counseling intervention that very much incorporated the stories of children, of young adults, and of families living with HIV, but also because we very much wanted the disclosure process to be one where children and adolescents were learning that HIV was just one part of the story of who they were. 
This study enrolled child and caregiver dyads uh, that were attending eight of the clinics within the AMPATH HIV treatment program in Kenya. The children were between the ages of 10 and 14 years of age when they enrolled in the trial. Of note, 10 years is the age that's um, laid out in the protocols for the clinical system as a time at which disclosure should have taken place or, or should be happening by. The clinics were randomized by clinic to either intervention or control, and the children and caregivers were followed for 24 months with assessments every six months. The intervention itself included a narrative-based curriculum for both disclosure and adherence counseling. This included videotaped narratives or short films that we used to introduce counseling sessions and provide educational content. It included tablet-based uh, animations or educational modules that were available for the counselors to use, as well as print resources, which included pamphlets and other uh, narrative documents in print. Most significantly, a dedicated counselor was put in place at each of the intervention clinics to provide family and or one-on-one -on -one counseling. The counselors also facilitated peer support groups at the intervention clinics. All of the intervention components were available to any of the, of the, part, any of the clients, any of the patients that were served by that clinic, not just those who were enrolled in the trial. At the standard of care clinics, they had a protocol for disclosure and for counseling and for adherence counseling in place. The staff had been trained on those uh, processes, but they had no particular dedicated time for providing that counseling. The primary outcome in this trial that I'm going to talk about today is disclosure status, which was looked at as a time to event outcome. And we also measured a number of secondary outcomes, including uh, variables related to the clinical status, to the mental health, the adherence, and HIV stigma experienced and perceived by these dyads. A synopsis of our results. So we enrolled 285 children and their caregivers. Their mean age was 12.3 years and about half were female. They'd been on treatment for an average of four years with 95% of them still on first line ART. At baseline, about one third of the children reported knowing their HIV status, which was the same for both the control and intervention groups. Interestingly, there were disagreements um, in the caregiver reports and the child reports of the child's disclosure status. At baseline, almost 20% of the dyads gave different answers in the pair. And in 90% of these cases of disagreement, the vast majority of the cases, the caregiver was reporting that the child's HIV status had been disclosed to the child, but the child reported that they did not know their HIV status. For the results I'm going to present, uh, we used the child's report of disclosure status, which was the more conservative measure since most of them were reporting that they did not know their status in the beginning. Disclosures in both the control and intervention arms increased over the two years of follow-up in the study, but the intervention arm had significantly more disclosures at each time point, with the most disclosures occurring at six months of follow-up. Using the child-reported disclosure, the prevalence of disclosure increased significantly, as I said, over the six months from 29% to 58% in the control arm and, 70, and 33 to 74% in the intervention arm, which was a significant difference at 24 months with a confidence interval there. We had both more disclosures and earlier disclosures for the intervention group with the largest increase and difference at six months. Um, the trends looking at our mental health outcomes in particular suggested that mental and behavioral distress increased at month six for the intervention group as the disclosures increased significantly, but then decreased compared to the controls thereafter and were not in fact significant at uh, 24 months of follow-up. This um, was a significant trend on the PHQ-9 for depression measures and then a similar trend, um, though non-significant was seen on the strengths and difficulties questionnaire with the similar variation in time that we did not present within this uh, poster for other mental health measures. Thank you. Actually, <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, wonderful presenters. I'm going to call my co-chair to take on the next session of uh, questions. So for those of you who just came in, we have we've had six wonderful presenters for this session, which was about 
hashtag generation, uh, next generation programming for adolescent. So anyone who would want to ask a question, we are going to ask questions first, then we have the speaker's answer, but I kindly request you say the, question, the person you're addressing the question to. Okay? So, Akedi? Hello. Um, so we have the mics, the three mics, here and there, and in every hour, we could start from either, either mic. You can just walk up to the mic if you have a question. Of course, some questions are generic, and I would also ask the panelists if at all you feel you have an answer to that question. Feel free to attempt to read. We can start with you. Hi, my question is for Dr. Kluvera. I was wondering um, if any of your researcher uh, findings could speak specifically to the um, cash versus the impact of cash versus care or combination of both. It's a, it's a great question. The question is, you know, in a sense, which is more important, the, the economic strengthening component or the or the, the kind of parenting component, particularly in the in those risk reduction outcomes. And we have just started looking at that. Um, and we, haven't, we just haven't got there yet. Give me your card, I'll send you the results when we get them. But it's looking like, there doesn't seem to be an interaction effect between the two, but we might just be underpowered for that. It is a cluster trial, and so it's quite hard to pick up power and things like that. But it really does look from that and from other research that, that there's something about teenagers where we need both and that you need to have a basic level of economic security within your home. You need to know that there'll be enough food to eat in your home. And you also need a sense of support from, and monitoring in particular from your parents. And it seems that for many adolescents, only with both of them do we see significant reductions in, in HIV risk behavior. Thank you. You can go ahead. Hello, thanks for your great presentations. This is for the last presenter, forgive me. I did not catch your name, but I am curious in noting that uh, with disclosure, there was an increase in stress, which would make sense. And interestingly, I'm sure that happened close to the time of disclosure. Can you talk about what it was that the um, support counselor was able to do over time or feedback from children or caregivers about what actually helped them decrease their stress? Was it simply time? Was it being more time to digest the discomfort? Was it actual strategies? Can you talk a little bit about that, please? Sure. I don't, I, I can't speak from our results yet in terms of which factors were most significant in that way over time. I will say from having read through lots and lots of um, counseling notes that were, were kept during this period as well as some of our um, other measures going through that some of the, I, I think some of it may just be a factor of time. There, there's a lot of discussion of having time to come to acceptance, but I think it's also critical that that, um, that there's support for the family during that time, that it's not just a time in which no more information is given, no more processing is given, no, no stress is going on. We did have a number of um, uh, counseling sessions and materials provided that were related to coping with stress, and, and it's possible that, that that was part of it, though, again, I can't speak from the results we have quite yet. The other, um, I think another interesting part that again remains to be fully analyzed with this is we were also measuring stigma quite a bit and I'm very curious um, to see what ultimately our results suggest from this analysis in terms of the impact of household levels of either perceived or feared stigma as well as enacted stigma um, in the family. Some of our results from other studies would suggest that that, that may have a, a, a significant impact particularly on um, some of the PHQ-9 and, and um, other measures of, of how well they're doing with resilience in that way. So unfortunately, I, I guess I can't, I can't tell you specifically from the evidence, but I think it is quite a number of, of factors. I don't think it was time alone, although I think that having supported, facilitated, um, you know, caring mental health engagement throughout that time period is, is likely critical as, as part of that. Okay, so maybe we can take the next three questions, then you get answers, that's fine. You can go first. 
Uh, thank you, everyone, for your wonderful presentation. My name is Hadir Mamdouh from Egypt, and uh, my question is directed to the last presentation from Professor Rachel, or Rachel, I'm not sure, uh, because I have been working closely with, people, with specifically children and adolescents living with HIV in Egypt and their caregivers. Um, so uh, my question is about like, do you, did you have like an ethical committee that uh, had like a special guidelines uh, related to dealing with the children and the adolescents? And did you have any observations which wasn't mentioned on the study results related to um, <clears throat> any, uh, I would say not a negative impact, but I would rather say not positive impact on the psychological status of the children and the adolescents involved in this study? Uh, I have a lot of questions specifically in this topic, uh, but like again, like it's about like the ethical committee and uh, like the result and how they did uh, give uh, consultation on the study and observation related to the psychological status of its children involved. Sure. So this study was approved by the local ethics committee at Moy University, um, as, as are all of the research studies in this context. We do have a fairly stringent set of procedures in place in terms of how consenting and assenting works in this setting and, the, and a, a localized protocol for how it, the age of that works as well as the ways in which our materials um, are really designed to avoid any inadvertent disclosures to children as, as part of this. Um, I think in terms of though the general um, intervention and thinking about the, the ethical issues related to that and, and, and likely the need to try to avoid or minimize negative uh, implications of that, I think one of the key factors is that it is the standard of care and the protocol both um, in this clinical care setting and actually nationally in Kenya to have HIV disclosure beginning around this age, if not, if not having been completed by this age. So in fact, we were not, um, you know, we were not pushing forward anything that was different in, in that sense as if that if by the protocol these children would have all been disclosed to already. In addition, um, we, we did a lot of qualitative work with this, and while certainly there were suggestions of ways in which, as the results showed, that um, stress and depression and things may have increased in the initial period, we, we also um, had lots of reports from children who had been disclosed to and adolescents who had been disclosed to in other ways um, where it was done accidentally or inadvertently or without any mental health support. And there, there certainly are lots of reports in the ways that which that finding out your status in those ways seems to be um, even more traumatic. But I completely agree that this is an incredibly you know, important area to think about and, and consider ethically as well. Thank you. We can have the next visit. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. My question is for speaker number five. 1948. <coughs> Hi, thank you. Um, I've also been doing some work in Durban. I'm Henry Sanpat. Uh, just some clarification on your methodology in your retrospective patient record review. Uh, did you look for information mainly in the clinical chart? Did you did you triangulate that with TIA and the NHLS database also? That's the first question. Uh, secondly, regarding loss to follow up among patients generally, some of them are in and out of care. Uh, did you find in that cohort that they reappeared at some time? And uh, the third point has to do with in this group, did you look at the viral load completion rate uh, of, what that, of what was due during that period? and then work out whether the viral load suppression that you're getting is an accurate reflection of viral loads actually done. These are the points of clarification. Thanks. Can I request we have all the, 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 the last person ask, then we can answer the questions because, yeah, so you can answer. Okay, thank you. A little short here. So I'm Gretchen Bachman. I work on the PETFAR program, sometimes in Kenya. And my question is for um, Rachel Freeman. Can you say a little bit about who you train to do the disclosure, what kind of educational background, how long the training took, and how you kind of monitored to make sure that you thought it went as you intended? Thanks. Uh, thank you for your questions. Uh, so I'll start with the first one, which is about uh, where we search for the clinical records. So at each facility that we went to, we also looked at their tier.net system. So 
for those who aren't very familiar with the South African uh, health system records, there isn't. Um, the tier.net systems are still based within each facility, so the tier.net records at one clinic won't necessarily link up to those in another facility. So at each of those 52 facilities, in addition to looking for the paper files, we search through the records on their tier.net. Um, we have not yet looked at the NHLS database, but we are hoping to do that soon. Um, so that is in the way, or not in the way, somewhere along the way. Um, in terms of loss to follow up in care and reappearing, so that was definitely one of the major concerns that uh, we had with the adolescents um, in terms of, it seems that there's a lot of challenges with linkage to care when you're moving from one facility to another, especially for adolescents as they're transitioning across multiple forms of care. So not just from a clinic to a hospital or back, but also from pediatric to adult care. Uh, what's very unique about our database, I think, is that we are able to capture what I would consider to be most of those uh, movements across facilities and re-entering into care because we are capturing so much, we're capturing so many of the clinics that they would be going to that if they reappear at one of the clinics because we search for all of the adolescents there, we should find their file. So we should know if there was a silent transfer. Um, and on the last point about viral completion rates so and viral load, uh, the next step for us to do is to actually longitudinally evaluate the viral load data itself. Um, so here it's just looking at the most recent viral load data, but that is something that we are working on right now as well. Um, and also in terms of how often the teens should be getting their viral loads done, uh, according to the national criteria, should it be at least annually? So for those who don't have a viral load within the past two years, um, that's definitely a concern. They should be having it more frequently recorded than that. Related to the question um, for the cadre of counselors that we used in this intervention, the counselors um, who were hired had fairly minimal um, requirements, I would say, in the scope of those providing mental health services. They were required to have a diploma, not a degree in a counseling-related um, area, and we were aiming for them to have a, at least one year of experience in counseling um, with, ideally with families or, or involving children. We provided a one-week counseling training, but um, importantly to note, our uh, curriculum was highly manualized and relied a lot on these um, filmed narratives as a starting point for entering the conversations with families. So sharing a story of, say, uh, a, a mother in a film talking about the things she was worried about with disclosure and then having guided questions to enter into what the caregiver might be um, concerned about as well, things along those lines. So they were really quite scripted in terms of the peer groups and the individual um, encounters. All of that being said, the counselors were excellent and an enormous resource, I think, for us. In terms of assessing their um, their uh, their standardization and quality throughout the intervention, we had them um, do a number of activities. So they documented their um, counseling evaluations in a structured form. We did weekly counselor reflections that we ended up, we first had them writing, but then ended up having them record audio, audio uh, um, verbally so that, so that we could um, look at the data that way because we found that that was more rich data than if they were having to write down what their reflections for the week were in terms of challenges. And then we also periodically had either um, actual encounters or uh, mock encounters observed by, by study personnel as well. So there were a number of things built in in that regard, but there also were a lot of ways in which the counselors were, you know, on a daily basis interacting with the families um, in, in whatever way they, they needed to. Okay, thank you. So we'll have the next question from the gentleman in the back, then the lady. Okay, thanks. I'm Andy Gibbs at the South African Medical Research Council. Two very quick questions, one for Nora. Um, your studies seem to show that the empowerment groups on their own didn't add much in addition to the youth-friendly clinics, and it was only when the cash got added on that there seemed to be big kind of additional effects. And I wanted to know why you thought that was. Was it the empowerment groups didn't work or what have you? And then quick question for Lucy as well. The violence you're talking about is from parents to children, and I wondered whether you looked at violence in intimate relationships, because obviously there might be some impact there or not. Can I suggest or ask the questions? You can go ahead. Hi, good afternoon. Um, my first question is for Nora, and it was more about um, what the best combination of um, 
activities at the health center or things that you were changing at the, the health center was. I know you have the graphs there, but it went by too quickly for me to catch that. And then also if you had any qualitative information from the girl participants themselves on um, you know, why those things were working better. So why one combination of services or approaches was working better than another. And then my second question was for Robin um, Miller. And you'd mentioned that um, later on in the program, there was a shorter time between um, reaching um, care and treatment. Um, and so I was wondering what caused the reduction in time? Um, was it just that things were rolling along more smoothly or were there some other factors that led um, to them accessing the care more quickly? Thank you. And you can go ahead and ask. My question is for Rachel Freeman. Again, like I need more clarification over the control, whether like the control was intention to treat and whether like uh, there's any kind of mix between, between the intervention and the control group that happened in the middle and like how you solve this problem if you faced it. Thank you. Okay. Great. So I think the, the first, I, there, were, there was a question about the role that empowerment played. Um, we didn't really see, so, so in the study, we didn't only look at clinical outcomes. We also looked at a range of behavioral outcomes. Um, and so whether girls were engaging in age disparate sex and transactional sex, um, how many sexual partners they had. And we had, we had hypothesized that the empowerment sessions would have a greater impact on, on those outcomes. Um, and so we're still in the process of analyzing that data. Um, we, we hypothesized less, we, we weren't sure if the empowerment would have a big impact on service uptake. Um, we saw that the clinic that had empowerment had slightly better, um, slightly more frequent uptake of HIV testing compared to the clinic that only had youth-friendly health services. Um, and we also um, saw that clinic four, which had cash and empowerment, had greater uptake of condoms and contraception and more frequent uptake of condoms and contraception um, compared to the site that only had youth-friendly health services and empowerment. Um, when we um, spoke to, we, we also conducted a qualitative sub-study, um, so have a lot of rich data from the young women themselves about what they appreciated. Um, and we heard time and again um, so, some of the themes that I've talked about. So young women really felt like going to the main clinic was hard because they didn't want to be seen by older adults from their communities and they wanted privacy. Um, we heard that having a space that was available during non-school hours was really important. So we, we offered services um, during some Saturdays and many afternoons. Um, and the third thing that we heard over and over again is that they felt like in the general clinic, they were judged for being sexually active by the providers um, and shouted at by the providers, and sometimes they weren't seen um, early enough by the providers because the providers were um, putting older women before them. Um, and so in the clinics that we created, um, we were really able to address those barriers, and we heard that from the young women. You can go ahead. Andy, it was a great question about the, the kind of killer question, what about intimate partner violence? Because this, is the, this program is only dealing with one type of violence that particularly young women are exposed to. And it's, it's a really interesting question because, of course, there have been some really effective IPV prevention programs developed, and particularly the one that's been used is the SASA program. And, um, and it... In many ways, it seems crazy that we have these two separate programs, and, and Gretchen at USAID, PEPFAR, and um, Charlotte Watts, who is one of the developers of SASA, and myself have been talking about this, because it's a real burden on countries to try and cons you know, simultaneously implement these separate programs, which all have their own requirements and their own training and their own manuals. Um, and, and partly that's actually because the, the, the IPV um, world has comes from a different disciplinary background to the child protection world. Um, and we're not very good as, as, as academics as working across our disciplines. 
But one of the things that we're going to be trying to do over the next few years is to think about can we combine our interventions, our effective interventions, and can we do it in such a way that you don't end up with like a 28 session program, but something that is feasible, achievable, and cost effective to do. So watch this space, maybe next AIDS conference. <laughs> Um, although I can't say that there was any one single special ingredient that I can identify, I think there were there are a number of key things that we know mattered uh, a great deal, both from the quantitative data we collected, but we also collected extensive qualitative data. So one of those things was that the person who was the dedicated full-time coordinator, besides doing nothing else but work the cases that came through the system in their city, uh, and to make sure that not only did the youth link to care, but that they then came back for follow-up medical care and remained engaged. That person had access to real-time information. So in some sites, uh, they would know that a youth was about to come in for their uh, test results and would be standing ready to then work with that youth to figure out what the obstacles were uh, for them to engage in care. Uh, so that real-time access to information was critical. Uh, it was certainly harder for the coordinators who worked in cities where they didn't have public health authority. Uh, therefore, they were really dependent on this integrated communications network that they created. So they all created a network of provider relationships within their city, and a lot of their time was spent maintaining that network and maintaining its value as a communication mechanism. So that also helped because it not only got real time, as close to real time information as you could get, uh, but it also meant that you had a team of people that you could rely on who could help you deal with any particular unique needs that a youth faced to move them rapidly into a physician's office. So that integrated network was uh, important uh, in addition to the 100% effort uh, that this person spent working with youth. Um, uh, the other thing I would say is that the clinics and referral sites work very hard on making themselves youth-friendly places, and I think the engagement data that we have, which I didn't talk about, suggests that they were moving in the right direction. Uh, for these particular sites, the rates of youth engagement, meaning returning to appointments, exceeded 80%. Uh, it was closer to 90% in some sites, and there were a couple sites that hit something like 98% engagement rates. But nonetheless, that's very high, considering that most of these are uh, folks that um, usually uh, experience uh, healthcare settings as unwelcome places. Um, so I think those things, and then when you add the structural pieces in that, that were pursued later, took care of the barriers that couldn't be addressed, not all of them, certainly, but started to address the barriers that couldn't be addressed by that kind of individual level face-to-face -face interaction that the coordinators um, engaged in. And I just, uh, wanted to add no, one comment to this very nice okay, study. Can we you make one it of the, your in sites, the next 30 seconds? Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to continue. Sure, you can go ahead. I apologize then. No, it's okay. okay. No, you so we also be aware of one of the sites, and I just want to highlight the presence of young advocates is crucially important. And while I didn't show this data for the red carpet, the presence and design of services by young people. That's what made the difference in the red carpet where we also increased linkage to care from 54% to over 96%. So young people need to be Absolutely. part of that service. Well, would have loved to go so, on. Natalia, you had a question, right? No? Did, did you? I, I think there was still a question for me I can yeah. answer quickly about the control okay. group yes. for the study. So okay. just, just to say very okay, quickly. Okay, you can go ahead and answer it, okay. then we can close. All Sorry. Right. <laughs> it was um, an intention to treat analysis. We didn't, by obvious measures, have dilution between the groups and that um, the, the children did not switch clinics, the providers did not switch clinics. Um, however, uh, we did allow um, for any of the control clinics to do whatever they might want to support disclosure. So, you know, they were welcome to be doing counseling, to hold peer support groups, but there was not program support for that or dedicated program time at that. I will say that I would imagine that the fact that research assistants were asking the families every six months about whether the child had been disclosed to likely increased disclosures among the control group as well, but yet we did still see significant differences in the setting where 
not only they, were they being assessed, but they were also receiving the counseling or had access to the counseling at least. Thank you so much. Well, a hand to the presenters. Thank you so much for the work you're doing in improving the health of adolescents out there. And I'm sure we're going to adjust to what they just presented around the work to do. Thank you so much. And thank you.